Well, if you take a moment to grab your Bibles and turn to 2 Kings chapter 22, children are dismissed with Miss Joy for Jumpstart. They're sneaking out the back door as always, Joy. Um, Ty, thank you very much for the pulpit. We'll get it here. And if you're turning to 2 Kings chapter 22, I'm going to be reading all the way from 22.3 to 23.3. It's going to take about three and a half minutes. So hopefully those of you who are able to stand for three and a half minutes, join me as we show respect for God's word. If not, just have your Bible in front of you and uh, we'll just uh, hear God's word preached to us and proclaimed. If you would stand, if you are able. 2 Kings 22, beginning at verse 3. In the 18th year of King Josiah, the king sent Shaphan and the son of Azaliah and the son of Mazullam, the secretary, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, that he may count the money that has been brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the threshold have collected for the people. And let it be given to the hand of the workmen who have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And let them give it to the workmen who are at the house of the Lord, repairing the house. That is, to the carpenters and to the builders and the masons. And let them use it for buying timber and quarried stone to repair the house. But no accounting shall be asked from them for the money that is delivered into their hand, for they deal honestly. And Helkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. And Shaphan, the secretary, came to the king and reported to the king, Your servants have emptied out the money that was found in the house, and have delivered it into the hand of the workmen who have the oversight of the house of the Lord. Then Shaphan, the secretary, told the king, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest and Akim the son of Shaphan and Akbor and the son of Micaiah and Shaphan the secretary and Isaiah the king's servant saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that have been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. So Hilkiah the priest and Akim and Akor and Shaphan and Isaiah went to Hilda, the, pre, the priestess, uh, the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikva, son of Horus, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she lived in Jerusalem in the second quarter and they talked with her and she said to them, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, tell the man who sent you to me, thus says the Lord, behold, I will bring disaster upon this place and upon its inhabitants of all the words of the book that the king of Judah has read, because they have forsaken me and have made offerings to other gods that they might provoke me to anger with all the work of their hands. Therefore, my wrath will be kindled against this place and it will not be quenched. But to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall you say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, regarding the words you have heard, because your heart was penitent and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard how I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they shall become a desolation and a curse, and you have torn your clothes and wept before me. I also have heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will gather you to your fathers and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see all the disaster that I bring upon this place. And they brought back word to the king. Then the king sent, and all the elders of Ju Judah and Jerusalem were gathered to him. And the king went up to the house of the Lord, and all with him, all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the priests and the prophets, all the people, both small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people joined in the covenant. May God bless and add his understanding to the reading of his holy word. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated and let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, as true today as the day it was written and spoken. In your word being heard, lives are changed. And as we see this in our reading today, may our lives be changed too. This and more we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, happy Mother's Day again to all of you because I will maintain whether you're a mother, been a mother, or had a mother, you're all included in some way or another, right? That means no flowers left over, okay, please? Take them home. Now, welcome to Jacksonville Presbyterian Church. It is my privilege to serve here as assistant pastor of congregational care. My name is Richard Evans. If I haven't met you already, most of the faces out there are fairly familiar, but if there are any who haven't had a chance to meet me yet, I'd love to take that time after the service today, and I'll only give you three flowers, I promise. We will continue in our sermon series today called whole and if you're wondering what that's about we're looking at the whole of God's word and at the moment we're going through the Old Testament one book per week uh, so we're in 2nd Kings today which is the 12th book of the Old Testament as we have it and so we're 12 sermons deep into a 39 sermon series and so we're about two-thirds of the way to the New Testament and we're learning a lot along the way. Now, last week we were in 1 Kings, and we looked at the grave mistake of Solomon's son, Rehoboam, who did not listen to his earthly father or his heavenly father. And the consequences, part of the consequences of that action was we saw the division in the kingdom grow to the point where 10, ki- ten tribes went off in the north and called themselves Israel, and two tribes remained in the south and called themselves Judah. And so we have a divided kingdom, a king in each place. It gets very confusing as you go along as to which king is ruling where at what time and who the other one is. But if you can follow all of that, uh, hopefully you've been reading along in 1 Kings and then into 2 Kings. The Ephraim Co-op will focus on 2 Kings this coming week. But if you're already into 2 Kings, well done. And you will have seen that there are a lot of kings there. How many of them are good? This many. How many of them are not good? Most of them. And of course, even the ones that are good in human eyes are not by the real metric, which is their devotion and faithfulness to God. All that to say, however, the real story that's going on, the real narrative is twofold. It is about the character of God and how he interacts with his people, and it is always pointing to the one true king that is to come, King Jesus. A lot has happened, however, in our uh, our passages from our reading last week to where we are this week, because we were almost at the very beginning of 1 Kings with Rehoboam making all those difficult and somewhat crazy uh, decisions. And here we are, almost at the last king, Josiah. There are just two or three more after him in the south, uh, the kings of Judah, uh, covering a period of about 20 years before Judah falls to the Babylonians. But we're going to take a moment to look at this king, Josiah, who, by that metric that I mentioned, devotion to God, faithfulness to God, is a good king. Now, as I say, before you think that we're leaving a lot out, we will be returning to a lot of these kings and their reigns and what was happening in the kingdom, because by its very nature, when we go through First and Second Chronicles, it's telling the same narrative from a different point of view. And when we get to all the prophets, when were they prophesying? During the reign of all these kings. So we're going to come back to a lot of these narratives and what God was teaching the nation and teaching us uh, through all all of this. And again, everything is pointing to Jesus. But in our reading today, what comes through very clearly, I believe, is that there is a, God is showing the nation and the people that there is a need for and a plan for revival. Not only in the hearts of people, but as corporately as a nation as well. And as someone who comes from Wales which is known as many things, including the land of revivals, I've had stories of revivals ringing in my ears my entire life. The stories of lives being changed by God. Whole villages and towns and the country being changed, being brought together, and in some ways being torn apart because of devotion, newfound and refound devotion to God by the movement of the power of the Holy Spirit. But there is one thing that's true when I hear all these stories. They're about revivals that happened over 100 years ago. 
And there's no doubt that there are still effects from those revivals. God is still at work. Revivals are still happening throughout the world in various places. But nobody is alive in Wales that lived during the time that those revivals were actually taking place. And as over the last 18 months, we've experienced a global pandemic, what I believe we need to experience and pray to God for is a global pandemic of the Holy Spirit and a movement that will be undeniable throughout the entire world. And that's the image that I couldn't shake as I read through the narrative of King Josiah. So we're going to take a moment just to consider this road of revival. The road of revival uh, is the title of the message today. We're going to walk through this passage on the road of revival. Nobody. My wife laughed at first service. Okay, so we're going to take four steps, four st- just four steps on uh, the road of revival as we consider it from our passage today. Now, as we start, we see that Josiah has been the king for 18 years. And you would think, 18 years, something would have happened before now, right? If he's a good king. Well, here's the thing. Usually we expect things within 100 days, right? Well, 18 years have gone by and nothing. Well, not completely nothing. And the explanation is, you know how old... Actually, if you read the beginning of 2 Kings 22, you'd know that Josiah was eight years old when he came to the throne. So, you know, for the first 18 years, he's, he's now 26, he is um, under the advisement of mentors, family members, other leaders, that kind of thing. So it isn't really until this point when he's really up and running and making the decisions fully on his own. But the one thing that we can clearly see is that he is a king who chooses wisely, unlike other kings who have chosen, particularly Rehoboam in our reading last week, who chose poorly. Already, before any of this happens, we notice that Josiah is already rebuilding and repairing. And that's the first step on the road of revival, to rebuild and repair, rebuild and repair. In the 18th year of King Josiah, the king sent Shepha... You know, I was wondering why they weren't just called Ethel, Fred, and Dave. (laughs) Shaphan, that's what it is. Maybe. Shaphan and Azaliah, son of Melezim, the the secretary to the house of the Lord, saying, go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, that he may count the money that has been brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the threshold have collected for the people, and let it be given to the hand of the workmen who have the oversight of the house of the Lord, and let them give it to the workmen who are at the house of the Lord, repairing the house. That is, to the carpenters and to the builders and to the masons, and let them use it for buying timber and quarried stone to repair the house. But, on no, but no accounting should be asked from them for the money that is delivered into their hand, for they deal honestly. In public and private worship, we need to be rebuilding and repairing, going beyond just maintaining our physical buildings and our bodies, taking care and strengthening our physical surroundings where we can meet together and invite others and our own physical, emotional and spiritual well-being as well. Investing in those who deal honestly. On a purely physical level, you've probably seen some of the improvements that have been happening around uh, the church campus over the last couple of years. No, the barn, that's B-A-R-N, right? My accent, I know. The barn over there has not always been that color. Surprise! (laughs) But there has been that kind of thing. There's been paint, there's been infrastructure, there's been new equipment that's been put in place over the last couple of years. And this is not so that we have the latest and greatest toys to play with. This is so that we can enable and equip worship in a meaningful way. And we need to take care of the buildings and what we have to be good stewards of it, to use it for the proclamation of the gospel and by its very nature then bring others into the opportunity to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's not so that we can prosper. As I said, that's so the gospel can be proclaimed. When God led Moses Williams in 1857 to plant the church... 
Jacksonville Presbyterian Church, First Presbyterian Church of Jacksonville, Oregon, um, they didn't have a building. They shared a building until 1881 when the historic church that still stands over there on California was completed, until this building was completed in 2006. But the church, the people, has been built by God the entire time. God has spoken inside and outside of the walls of any building. But there's always need for rebuilding and repair of buildings and repair and rebuilding of our relationship with God. By the time Josiah is rebuilding and repairing the temple, it's been in bad shape because previous kings have not taken care of it. In fact, many of them have worshipped other gods, built other places of worship, erected idols and high places, have drawn people away from God and away from the worship of the one true God. For many in the world today, that is still the case. There are places and idols that are in all of our lives that can take hold of us, that can draw us away from gathering together in the house of the Lord and draw us away from our relationship with God. They're not always as obvious as the ones that were there during Josiah's time. The need to rebuild and repair in our lives is as important now as it has ever been. And the good news is, it is something that we clearly have the designs, the plans, and yes, the permits for. We do not have to be the architects, but we can be the laborers. And this brings us to the second step on the road of revival. Step two, rediscover and read. Rediscover and read. If we are to follow the plan so that our rebuilding and repairs can go ahead in the right way, we need to rediscover and read the plan. Hilkiah finds the book of the law. Verse 8. And Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. And Shaphan the secretary came to the king and reported to the king, your servants have emptied out the money that was found in the house and have delivered it to the hand of the workmen who have the oversight of the house of the Lord. Then Shaphan the secretary told the king, Hilkiah the, high, the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Okay, how many of you play with Lego? Okay, there's a few of us, right? Thank you, not on my own. And the thing with Lego is that you can make just about anything you want, right? You, you, can, you don't have to stick to the plan. You can kind of put it together however you want. But the reality is, if you want it to look like the picture on the box, if you want it to be what it was designed to be, you need to look very carefully at that picture and try and replicate it. And even then, you're probably going to have pieces left out that you've left out because you can't see them, right? And it's not going to stick together properly. It's going to fall apart. So what do you need to do? You need to read the instructions and put it together. And yes, before you say, I know there are always extra pieces in a Lego set and there's pieces left over even when you've done it completely. But you get the point. Hilkiah finding the instructions, the book of the law, is not a coincidence. By this stage, it is believed that it has been lost from the entire kingdom for around 75 years. And so what have people been doing what has been going on well they were either making it up as they went along they were looking to the nations around them they were following other gods or they were just not following god at all now that's not exclusively of course there were prophets still around there were those who knew the word of the lord but the majority that was the case in the nation most scholars believe that the book of the law that's referred to here is the pentateuch the first five books of the bible genesis exodus leviticus numbers deuteronomy and at the very least, it is the book of Deuteronomy. Either way, what is for sure is the effect that it has on the king when it's read to him. It isn't just a matter of, here, here's a book. It was actually read to him. And it made a huge difference to him and to the nation. And I couldn't help but think back five years, almost exactly five years, to when we took a group from the church to Wales. And one of the places that we went and visited was St. Giles Parish Church in Wrexham. 
And as we were having a tour from the vicar there, he said, oh, I, we found a book in the back of a dusty cupboard that's been there for years, but your group might like to see it. And we said, oh, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll have a look, you know. We like history and things like that, not knowing that what they pulled out was a first edition King James Bible that had been stuck in the back of a dusty cupboard for many, many years. Now, it wasn't that they didn't have other Bibles, right? It wasn't that this was the only Bible they had. But they had had that one stuck in the back of a cupboard for years. We're fortunate now. We've got the Bible at our fingertips, printed, electronic. You know, it's almost impossible to get away from it in some respects, right? We carry, many of us carry it with us in our pocket 24-7 which is great. But the question is, do you look at it? Do you read it? Or is it put away in the cupboard from one Sunday to the next? And are we surviving on one spiritual meal? And is that all that's keeping us from starving throughout the whole week? We do not want to have a 75-year period of the church not having the Word of God as its main meal. And from this clear history, it makes good sense that we need to have the book of the law before us. And yet, when I was in college, I was warned about the dangers of preachers that were beginning to preach that, and taking their text directly from the newspaper and not even referring to the Word of God. Hard to imagine that happening today, isn't it? Of course, there are those places in the world today that it is hard to get hold of a, a copy of God's Word in any form. And that's why we so eagerly support Bible translation and distribution, both printed and audio recording, because there are those, even if you give them a Bible in their language, they don't read. So having an, a reliable audio recording of it in their language is super important as well. Some have suggested that the way that this one and only copy of the word was hidden in the first place, was by Hilkiah himself. And so he took the opportunity to find it and then pass it to the king. <laughs> Have you hidden the word of God in your heart to share it with others? We'll get back to that in a moment. But first, let's take a moment to take the next step on the road of revival. And we'll see this is illustrated in Josiah's reaction to the book of the law being read to him. Take for a moment again this, this point that even though this is yet to happen, he's already been rebuilding and repairing the temple. It's almost as if God has been working in his life already before he even has the word of God read to him. How many of you can, uh, can identify with that? Does that resonate with you? You think back over your walk with the Lord that actually the, work, the Lord was at work long before you had a fuller understanding of who he was and what he has done and what he is doing. It's all about him. Well, the next step is step three. Repent and relearn. Repent and relearn. Verse 11 onwards. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest and Achikim the son of Shaphan and Achbor the son of Mechael and Shaphan the secretary and Isaiah the king's servant saying, go inquire of the law for me. And for the people and all of Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. So Hilkiah the priest and Achim and Abor and Shaphan and Isaiah went to Hildar the prophetess, the wife of Shalom and the son of Tikva, son of Horus keeper of the wardrobe. Now she lived in Jerusalem in the second quarter and they talked with her and she said to them, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, tell the man who sent you to me, thus says the Lord, behold, I will bring disaster upon the place and upon its inhabitants, all the words of the book that the king of Judah has read because you have, they have forsaken me and have made offerings to other gods and they have may, might provoke me to anger with all the work of their hands. Therefore, my wrath will be kindled against this place and it will not be quenched. But to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall you say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, regarding the words that you have heard, because your heart was penitent and you humbled yourself before the Lord, when you heard how I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and you have torn your clothes and wept before me, I have also heard you. 
declares the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will gather you to your fathers and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace and your eyes shall not see all the disaster that I will bring upon this place. And they brought back word to the king. Josiah's immediate reaction is to tear his clothes. And if you don't know, that was an outward and visible sign that people made of repentance in their life. He realized not only what he had not been doing, but what the nation had not been doing. They had not been following the one true God. This had an immediate effect in his life and by very definition in his leadership. He was already a good king, but now he's really in line with the king that's described in Deuteronomy itself in chapter 17, verse 20. That his heart may be lift, not be lifted up above his brothers and that he may not turn aside from the commandment either to the right hand or to the left so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. Some scholars suggest that Josiah even transcends David in his faithfulness and his devotion to God. He does more than just acknowledge the fault. He really is a great example of repentance. He actively begins to do something about it. And as he's the king, this not only affects him and his household, but the life of the entire nation. And it changes the depth of his devotion to God. And of course, as we said, the way that he leads others. For us today, the depth of relationship with God affects our relationships. It affects our families, our friends, our work colleagues, our community, our church, our very spheres of influence that God places us in day in and day out. So what is the next thing that Josiah does that we can learn from? Well, he sends to someone to have an interpretation, to hear from God. What is going on? How is this going to affect things? Now, we do not have prophets in a biblical sense today, of course. But we do have those in our lives that we can listen to, that we can learn from, that we can discuss with, that we can be sharpened by. It's the reason for studying the word together. For the preaching of the word, the reading of commentaries and books, and of course the listening to the Holy Spirit in whatever form he speaks, knowing that he will never contradict the written word of God. The message that comes back to the king, of course, firstly is for him personally, that uh, through his faithfulness, through his repentance and in humbling himself, he will not see the disaster for himself that will come upon the nation, because it's still going to come. The great reminder that sin in all its forms, although God will and has forgiven, the consequences are still experienced. But from them, God will bring about his plan, his purpose in our lives and in the world. It brings us to our final step on the road of revival, which is Recount, reform, and be refined. Recount, reform, and be refined. 2 Kings 23, 1 to 3. Then the king sent, and all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem were gathered to him, and the king went up to the house of the Lord, and with him all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the priests and the prophets, all the people, both small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that has been found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people joined in the covenant. The king does not keep all this news to himself. He recounts it to others, to all of the people, not just the high and mighty, not just the influential, not just the wealthy, not just the people within his kingly court, but to all of the people, both great and small, to use the words there in 2 Kings 23. Another great lesson that the word of God is to be shared with everyone and is for everyone. How have you shared the word of the Lord lately? Have you read it and simply learnt the lessons for yourself? 
or taking the time to share it with those you come into contact with. There are so many ways to do that, from simply reading scripture to somebody else, to putting a verse on an email, to allowing the word of God to flavor your conversations and to those you know believe and those you don't. And you may find yourself in a position that it's, it's difficult to share the word openly and directly. But I want to suggest there are times when you can share the word without saying where it's from. And then if someone asks you, oh, that's interesting, where'd that come from? There's an open door. Person asks the question, all you're doing is answering it, right? And then you see where the Lord takes it. Talking of ways of uh, starting a conversation, I don't know how many of you know John Humpton, our sound tech, but he's got, if, you, if you've spent any time with John, you'll notice he's got some tattoos. He's got some on his arms that to some people look just like pretty patterns. To other people, they realize it's a language. And to others, they realize it's the very word of God because he's got Greek and he's got Hebrew. Various verses. Now, do not hear what I'm not saying. What what I'm not saying. I am not saying go out and all get Greek and Hebrew tattooed on your arms, unless that's your thing. But what I'm saying is, anything can be an opportunity, right? There's always ways to share God's word in a way that comes up naturally. It might be you share how God's word has changed your life, how it's been the most positive thing. Or perhaps it's been the most challenging and difficult thing. By recounting the word, Josiah gives all the people the same opportunity that he has had to be affected by it and be saved. And ultimately, what is he doing? He's pointing to not himself as the king, but to Jesus as king. Well, if you've read on in chapter 23, or I encourage you to do so this coming week as part of the the co-op or or part of your your devotional time, you'll see that what Josiah does next, as I say, he doesn't just talk about it, he puts his money where his mouth is and he enacts a lot of reforms, right? So he's recounted, now he's reforming. He tears down the idols and the altars to the false gods. He restores the Passover, which again had not been celebrated for quite some time. He puts away mediums and necromancers and household gods. These kind of idols still exist, you know. And they still need the same action taken that Josiah took. We still have a king who reforms us every single day, King Jesus. And if we're truly devoted to him, we will want these things out of our lives and out of the lives of the people around us. We might say that we're reformed in our theology, but there's always reformation to be done. Finally, we do see that God still needs to refine the kingdom of Judah. And just like the kingdom of Israel before it, Kingdom of Israel, the ten northern tribes that fell to uh, the Assyrians in 722 BC. Now it's the turn of Judah to fall to the Babylonians in 586. Again, by this time, 25 years or so before uh, Josiah had uh, died, he'd been gathered in a time of peace to his fathers, as they say. One of the phrases for saying that he passed away, that he died, he was buried. So indeed, uh, that prophecy, that promise of God happened and was true. But through that refiner's fire, God is restoring. He is saving his people. And long after Josiah's death, Jesus came and was and is the one true king. And today we still experience being refined through God's action with us. But the aim is always the same, to make us more of God's people, to draw us closer to God for God's glory and for our good. So today, we are on the road of revival, rebuilding, repairing, rediscovering, reading, repenting, relearning, recounting, reforming, and being refined. To his name be the glory, the honor, and the praise now and forever. Let us pray. 
almighty and everlasting God. We thank you for the work that you are doing in the lives of your people, in the lives of your church, in the lives of your kingdom. It may not be a small country in one place, 12 tribes anymore. It is a people that spread throughout the world, but we are united spiritually through Jesus Christ. May we see a global pandemic of the Holy Spirit spreading across this world and we would not be able to mistake it for your work and your will and your way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.